we have finally arrived at my personal favorite topic, which is uh, psychiatry and behavioral health. And so this is all the stuff that I was really interested in when I was doing my clinical work, uh, the stuff that I still am super interested in because I really like behavioral disorders, um, mostly because I really like crazy people. <laughs> It makes me feel like I'm hanging out with my friends when I'm working in a psychiatric ward, you know. Um, <laughs> everyone that's in the psychiatric ward, uh, there's never a dull moment, always really interesting stories. There's sad moments too, right, because you'll, you'll see patients at their very worst, at some of their lowest points in life when they hit rock bottom. Uh, lots of patients with suicide attempts, you know, failed suicide attempts, thankfully. Um, patients that have had multiple suicide attempts. Um, I had a patient that he didn't, he lost his leg because he tried to commit suicide by jumping onto the subway platform when the train was coming. He didn't die, but he lost his leg in the process. Then when I was seeing him, he tried again to commit suicide. So you'll see like repeated suicide attempts in a lot of patients. Um, one patient I had was a nurse. She had gotten fired for some reason and she took a lethal dose of insulin. Luckily, it wasn't lethal enough because she survived, but she uh, collapsed, she lost consciousness, she smashed her face, her nose was all broken, she was completely bloodied up when we saw her in the psychiatric ward. Um, you'll have patients that uh, overdose on drugs, substance abuse issues, all sorts of really fascinating stuff. Um, and the mental health crisis keeps on getting worse and worse and worse for whatever reason, and one in eight people take antidepressants, but for some reason, depression is still on the rise, and, you know, there's studies out there that talk about the efficacy of those types of antidepressant drugs. They don't really work very well. So even though people are taking more and more antidepressant drugs, depression still continues to grow. Um, and so there's a lot of research now in alternative modalities for treatment for things like depression. Uh, ketamine clinics are all over the place now, and they are very helpful for patients who have uh, refractory depression. Um, the FDA finally approved psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, so now there's going to be the uh, uh, possibility for psychotherapists to work with their patients while using psilocybin as adjunct therapy during the cognitive behavioral therapy. So we're seeing more of that stuff nowadays, and it's awesome. Like We're, I think, sort of in the renaissance, a cool new renaissance within psychiatry, within behavioral health. So it's a really great field. Um, very rewarding field, very interesting field. And uh, yeah, also I peppered this entire lecture with some of my favorite artists. Uh, like I said, I really like crazy people and I like a lot of crazy artists. Like for example, Vincent Van Gogh, one of the greatest exhibits I've ever been to was back in DC when I was doing my clinicals out there. They had a whole exhibit on Vincent Van Gogh's repetitions works. And you can see it like upfront and personal, like, just the beauty of his work and like all the brush strokes and you know it was it was a very uh, surreal experience to be able to see his work in person so i really like his work but unfortunately for him he, he was plagued by manic depression lots of artists are plagued by manic depression and schizophrenia as we'll talk about uh momentarily so this is what we're going to be focusing on here is going to be the anxiety disorders so panic disorder social phobia ptsd GAD, or Generalized Anxiety Disorders, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. We're going to talk a little bit about depression. We're going to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. And then we are going to talk about schizophrenia. This just skims the surface of all the different disorders in psychiatry. If you want to, for whatever reason, have a fun read, get a copy of the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of uh, Mental Health Diseases. It's a fascinating read. Um, it's mostly used for like, you know, diagnosis and also coding purposes. So you can code different types of diseases. But if you read through like the descriptions and stuff, very cool stuff. It's a very, very interesting read. So let's get into some of the basics of uh, psychiatry. So let's first talk a little bit about fight and flight response because this is what's going to be involved in anxiety type disorders. So fight and flight response, it's going to be mediated by your catecholamines. So if you have like a lot of anxiety, lots of panic, right? You're in a moment of stress, that's going to be mediated by your catecholamines. So you have like a catecholamine release, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, sometimes patients with generalized anxiety disorders and they're having like a panic attack, 
sometimes they think they're having a heart attack. That's how much their heart is going to be racing and pumping. They're going to feel the palpitations in their chest. They literally think they're having a heart attack, plus the chest pain. You can also get chest, chest pain with this. So it's all because it's going to be mediated by catecholamines. Bless you. So anxiety is a state of being uneasy, apprehensive, or worried about what may happen. That is what anxiety is. Anxiety can be a normal uh, emotion. It depends on the circumstances, right? Like if you are getting run down by a lion, it's good to feel anxious at that moment, right? Um, if you're in a fight and flight scenario, if you're, you know, getting attacked by something or whatever, you have to like get into a fight and flight reaction. That is normal to experience anxiety, right? So it's um, there's also uh, anticipatory stress, right? You're anticipating something coming up that might cause, you know, pain. <laughs> like, think about you guys have an exam coming up in two, two days. You might be having some stress and anxiety about the test. That's usually a good thing because you want to have, like, a little bit of anxiety. They call this eustress. Eustress compared to distress. Distress is not good. That is not beneficial at all. Eustress can act as a powerful, motivating force. You stress is what's going to motivate you guys to study your asses off so you do well on Friday's exam, right? So that's good amounts of stress. So that's normal. But if it starts interfering with your day-to-day -day activities, that's when you're not in a good place, right? So when anxiety interferes with day-to-day -day activities or relationships, then it may be classified as a disorder. So that would be distress, and then that would fall under the category of anxiety-type disorders, right? And there's a ton of different anxiety type disorders. Um, this is a famous painting, right? So I'm sure all of you guys have seen this painting. Uh, so uh, Munch, Edvard Munch, painted this while he was having an, a panic attack. And so he had several panic attacks throughout his life. So this actually inspired um, his painting. So lots of really cool connection with psychiatry and mental health disorders. Um, this is, it's very common just to get anxiety. Right, lots of people have anxiety, just like depression. Depression is very common, and oftentimes anxiety and depression both go hand in hand. It's hard to parse them apart sometimes. Sometimes you will see depression coupled with anxiety. So these are the different types of disorders that we're going to be covering today. These are the ICD-10 uh, coding. Uh, if you have a patient that has these types of disorders, that's what you code. That's how you, you do this for like billing and insurance purposes. And so we're going to talk about panic disorder, GAD. We're going to talk about um, OCD, PTSD, agoraphobia, specific phobias. And then I threw in bipolar here. I'm actually not going to test you on bipolar. Um, a lot of my colleagues don't even talk about bipolar. Uh, I've encouraged uh, the program to change so that we include bipolar because bipolar is a very significant psychiatric condition, especially bipolar 1. Bipolar 1 is the one that usually results in hospitalizations, not so much bipolar 2. So that's why I threw it in here, but I'm not going to test you on it. But bipolar is a very important condition because you're going to see it in the future if you work in behavioral health. So anxiety disorders, the most popular of them all is going to be GAD. But other ones fall under anxiety disorders too, right? So PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, phobias, those all fall under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. But GAD is by far going to be the most con um, common one of them all. I'm going to play just a little bit of this, but it's a very long video. It's like seven minutes long. So I'll play maybe a few minutes. Anxiety. 
take an assessment and where you're going to feel anxious about the cover of the Change it from school or work. Cover it up with that. This anxiety is a choice to be reasonable. Lessons from this fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, insomnia, or difficulty sleeping. People with GAT also can explain their anxiety using those of most. This is because their anxiety stems from various sources. Those who suffer from GAT can find relief in a number of treatment options, ranging from life to exercise. Exercise is one of them. All right, we're not going to go to the rest of those because some of them are not going to be relevant for the purpose of this class, but feel free to watch that video on your own time. We're definitely not going to talk about separation anxiety. <laughs> uh, but someone had a question? All right, so anxiety disorders, like I said, they're very, very, very common. Um, they are the most common of all the mental health disorders. Um, you can get anxiety about anxiety as well, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you get a panic attack, just knowing that you might get a panic attack, attack in the future might give you like more anxiety. So <laughs> this is like a never-ending cycle. So you might actually become avoidant because of that. You might avoid specific situations that can induce panic attacks and anxiety. Risk factor, lots of different things. We're gonna talk about risk factors for a lot of these diseases. They tend to be multifactorial. Lots of things affect psychiatric conditions. It could be genetics, it could be the environment that you grow up in or the environment that you're in currently. Um, it could also be uh, the way that you develop uh, psychologically, right? So there's going to be nurture versus nature involved in a lot of these conditions. Um, how do you treat anxiety disorders? Uh, you can do psychotherapy and you can do pharmacotherapy as well. Psychotherapy is really good because you're not doing drugs with psychotherapy. So talk therapy is actually very effective. So for anxiety, for depression, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT tends to be like the gold standard, but there's done tons of other types of therapeutic models as well. There's like rational, emotional, uh, behavioral therapy, REBT, there's tons of other different types of therapies. Um, most of those modalities tend to be effective. Right? CBT just tends to, like, tends to be one of the most commonly practiced ones. It's like the most popular of all the th uh, therapeutic models. Um, drugs, pharmacotherapy for anxiety, uh, it can help, I guess. The only problem with a lot of these drugs is that they're very addictive. So like benzodiazepines, uh, the two drugs that you die from when you're withdrawing are going to be alcohol and benzos. So alcohol, you can get delirium tremens. We talked about that already. You get like autonomic instability. You can get the same kind of thing with anti, uh, sorry, with anxiolytic drugs. So benzodiazepines can actually kill you if you're withdrawing from them and you don't taper off them properly. And when people get like, I don't want to say, I'll say dependent. When they get dependent on benzodiazepines, it's really hard to come off of them. Um, Xanax, uh, Valium, you know, dia um, uh, Alprazolam, all those different drugs are going to be really hard to get off of. But some people have to use them, right? It helps to like, alleviate their uh, crippling anxiety. Beta blockers can also be used. Did I tell you guys about the my colleague that got slipped a beta blocker before he had to give a speech. Yeah, so we talked about that already. So beta blockers can be really good to help prevent performance anxiety. So metropolol, for example, would be a good drug that you can use. Very benign, like I said before. Don't roofie your colleagues, but I guess it's a better roofie than other roofies out there. <laughs> so, but beta blockers are a good drug if you have like anxiety about like public speaking, things like that. It helps to like slow down your heart rate, and so good stuff. Panic attacks. Panic attack is going to be a symptom, but it's not a actual disorder, right? So uh, if you had a panic disorder, that's something else. That would be uh, constant panic attacks. Right? But panic attack is going to be just a symptom. So there's lots of different things that you can feel with a panic attack. You can have just kind of like this feeling of impending doom, right? You don't know what's going on, but you feel like something bad is about to happen, right? So that's a, f a feeling of impending doom. 
um, other things, right? Uh, feelings that you might be going crazy, that you might be going mad, um, fears of dying, right? A lot of our uh, uh, panic disorders, the, this is going to underlie a lot of them, the fear of death, fear of dying. Um, chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, hyperventilation, numbness and tingling. Lots of that stuff is similar to a heart attack, right? And so patients that have a panic disorder or they have like generalized anxiety disorder and they're having, going into a panic mode, a lot of times they think they're literally having a heart attack. They think they're going to die and they have that sensation of impending doom. That person goes to the emergency room. You would immediately do a 12 lead EKG, right? When a person is, ha if you think someone's having a heart attack, the very first thing you do is give that person or put them onto an EKG. You want to see what their heart looks like, right? That's the first thing you do. Then you do cardiac enzymes and cardiac markers and all that stuff later. But first thing you do is EKG. For these patients, they might be tachycardic. They might have an accelerated heart rate. But aside from that, everything else looks normal on EKG. So that would be a panic attack. You see panic attacks with all of these, right? With GAD, with PTSD, panic disorders, agoraphobia, specific phobias. So let's talk about panic disorder. Uh, it's going to be pretty common. So 2.7% of the entire population is going to have this. Females are disproportionately going to have panic disorder compared to males. And it's going to be in their 20s is when these disorders uh, come about most, uh, most frequently. So you can have recurrent panic attacks. They could be unexpected, and sometimes they can happen for no reason. Um, for To meet diagnostic criteria, you have to have a month of these. And you get the fight and flight response. That's going to be the main sign and symptom. So palpitations, you might get sweaty, diaphoresis, chest pains, hypertensions, or sorry, hyperventilation, shortness of breath, all that stuff. The person thinks they're literally having a heart attack. Right? And so that's going to be panic disorder. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is a little bit more, right? You have to have this going on for at least six months or longer. Again, most common, commonly seen in women, uh, and it's quite a bit of the population. 3% of the population experiences GAD. So what's going to happen here? You're, uh, what are some of the things that trigger anxiety or GAD? Responsibilities, your job, health issues, Money, relationships, family, all that stuff can, can trigger generalized anxiety disorder. And the person is always going to feel worried. They are constantly concerned and worried. Um, they feel on edge. They feel restless. Those are all like the hallmarks of GAD. And this goes on for a long time, over six months. They also get fatigued, difficult concentration. Bruxism is something that you see at, uh, especially at night. Uh, they'll get like teeth grinding. You see this with PTSD patients too, right? Like, bruxism to the point where sometimes they can actually get severe damage to their teeth, and they'll have to like get actual like you know, dental procedures to help correct the damage done. Tachycardia, palpitation, shortness of breath with GAD. So this is directly from the DSM. Um, this is part of the diagnostic criteria for G uh, GAD on the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Diseases. So anxiety, worry, to the point where it interferes with your day-to-day -day activities for at least six months. So you can get like restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentration, all that stuff. So these are all going to be the signs and symptoms of GAD. You also want to rule out other things. For example, you want to rule out hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can cause all these symptoms too, right? So this could be an organic underlying mechanism. So if they're hyperthyroid, then you can treat them for that, right? So uh, you want to rule that out. You also want to rule out substance abuse as being the underlying cause of this. That's, this goes for a lot of DSM diagnoses. You really want to rule out other causes for the disorder. Schizophrenia too, because you could be psychotic but that could be psychosis uh, induced by drugs, like methamphetamines. You can have cocaine-induced psychosis. Lots of drugs can cause psychosis. You also want to rule out drug uh, and substance abuse as well. So, um, My colleague usually prints out the whole GAD thing for you guys to like fill out. I didn't print any out. But if you want to do a, like a questionnaire for yourself to see if you fit any of the diagnostic 
uh, uh, categories of this. You can do this yourself. And if you fit any of the diagnostic categories or diagnostic criteria, rather, then you should go see your doctor <laughs> to, you know, to maybe uh, get some uh, therapy of some sort. But feeling nervous and anxious, you know, you could say like nearly every day, three. Not being able to sleep properly and because of worrying, for example, nearly every day. Trouble relaxing, uh, being restless, easily annoyed or irritated, feeling afraid that something awful might happen. So if you fill out three for all these, like nearly every single day, then if you get like a total of above 21, that would be like severe um, anxiety. So you would be officially, you could officially be diagnosed with GAD, um, depending on uh, how severe you, uh, how severe all these symptoms are for you. So that's an example of one of the questionnaires that you can do. And there's questionnaires for everything. There's questionnaires for depression. Um, there's questionnaires even for like uh, delirium tremens for alcohol. You can actually run through like a bunch of the, it wouldn't really be like self-reported. It wouldn't be more like the physician going through and like checking off all the boxes. But there's lots of different questionnaires available out there. So you can you know, see if you have any of these types of conditions. So phobias. Um, there's different types of phobias. There's going to be specific phobia. And a specific phobia would be like, for example, fear of heights, fear of snakes, spiders, like arachnophobia, as an example. Um, social phobias. Phob that's being afraid of being humiliated in public, right? So you would probably be, be very avoidant of public situations, like speaking in public, using the restroom, eating in front of other people. Agoraphobia is a little bit different. This is the fear of um, not being able to escape. And then something that underlines agoraphobia is also the fear of death in a situation, the fear of dying in public. That's kind of what underlines agoraphobia. But what it kind of translates to, practically speaking, is the person is really afraid of going out into a situation that they can't escape from. So that would be agoraphobia. So let's briefly talk about specific phobias. Very common, again, more common in females than men but you have a very irrational and persistent fear of something, whether it's snakes, spiders, whatever. Um, you can see, you can get panic attacks, panic attacks if you get exposed to what's causing the fear. Now, what is something you could do to treat this? Think about the cognitive behavioral therapy. Exposure therapy, exactly. So what you do is you don't just expose the, the patient to something that causes fear. You invite them to uh, expo get exposed to those uh, fears, right? So it has to be voluntary. You have to be like, do you feel comfortable with me maybe like showing you like, a picture of something that you're afraid of? So that maybe they might start looking at the picture, right? Then you can actually like, may maybe if they're afraid of like elevators or something like that, then you can say, do you feel comfortable maybe like walking up to an elevator? So you can like look at the elevator and see if you would elicit a response. So you slowly expose the person to what causes the fear until they can eventually, hopefully, overcome the fear. That's the whole purpose of exposure therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So for an elevator, maybe you see, look at pictures of elevators. Maybe go up to an elevator. Maybe get into the elevator at some point once you like get over overcome those fears. You can do that with basically any of the specific phobias. Same thing with like animals, right? So like spiders. You could be like, maybe you'll look at pictures of spiders. Maybe maybe go to like a zoo or something like that where they have spiders available to look at like come in contact with. Maybe if it's a tarantula or something, tarantulas usually are pretty docile. Maybe like you can like have the patient eventually like muster up the courage to maybe pet a tarantula. Most of you guys say no to that. Really? You don't like tarantulas? Tarantulas? Not all spiders are poisonous. <laughs> but a lot of them are. <laughs> children? <laughs> Do you have like a phobia of children? <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, infants kind of make me feel uncomfortable because I'm afraid of hurting them, right? like dropping them or something. I have like this irrational fear of dropping a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any kids yet, but once I have kids, God willing, hopefully I'll get over that fear. <laughs> Anyways, spiders are cool, man. I like spiders. I have a, I have a, I used to have a pet tarantula, but it died recently, unfortunately. I don't know about that. They can like they said they can shoot off hairs, the urticating hairs that they get into your eyes that can cause issues. Yeah. 
Yeah, only if you like put them into a stress state. Okay, whatever. I'm not going to win this argument against you guys. Apparently, a lot of you have uh, arachnophobia, so there you go. Here's your specific phobias. It looks like at least half of you have this one over here, arachnophobia. I still don't know how to pronounce this one. <laughs> Arachibutyrophobia. Fear of peanut butter getting stuck to the top of your mouth. And then uh, chlorophobia, fear of clowns. This is a hilarious list. I, let's go over some of these because there's like so many of these. So fear of darkness, acluophobia, uh, acoustophobia, acousticophobia, fear of noise, fear of dust, <laughs> amathophobia, fear of walking, ambulophobia, the fear of amnesia. <laughs> Amusophobia. I like this one. Anglophobia, fear of England or English culture. <laughs> I actually had this one over here. I'm afraid of numbers, so <laughs> arithmophobia. That's why I never did so well in physics. <laughs> uh, anyways, if you oh, fear of Bolsheviks. <laughs> fear of those commies. I have that now. <laughs> Uh, anyways, that's, some of these are really... Fear of chopsticks, wow. How do you pronounce that? Consecutophobia, anyways. Anyways, there's that list for you guys to have fun if you want to go through those, maybe share those with some of your friends and stuff and family over Thanksgiving. You can tell them that, they're, that you're all Anglophobes, if you're of the British. Other phobias, uh, this one is really freaky, the tri tripophobia. And I think the etymology uh, has to do with tripe. Right? You guys know what tripe is? Especially some of y'all who are Mexicans or Latin Americans. Tripe. Menudo. You don't like menudo? I love menudo. My mom is from, my, my mom's Brazilian, so like she would make tripe when I was a kid. I hated it when I was a kid, but I learned to love it, especially with the chickpeas. It's very nice. And then in like Mexican culture, you got menudo, which is like, yeah. So, it's, you know, when you look at it, it's got the little like, it looks like honeycombs, right? So that's kind of, I think, what underlines the etymology of tripophobia. So you're, friend, you're afraid of like holes like honeycombs and things like that. Anyways, I am not going to test you on any of these phobias, by the way. So you don't worry about memorizing all these different phobias. So they're just there for you to uh, enjoy. <laughs> so social phobias. So that's going to be social anxiety. So very common. Uh, it's actually equal between men and women. And it's a fear of being rejected, fear of humiliation. Um, and so basically what happens is that over a course of six months, at least, if you avoid social situations, you can be diagnosed with social phobias. Agoraphobia. Again, this is kind of like the fear of being trapped, the fear of not being able to escape, but also it's kind of coupled with the fear of dying in public, right, to be witnessed uh, dying. So that kind of undergirds what agoraphobia uh, is. And so you avoid tight places, you avoid places that you can't escape from. And again, six months, that's the uh, cutoff for agoraphobia. So you might have fear of being outside or home alone. You might be afraid of using public transit. You might be afraid of open spaces. You might be afraid of enclosed spaces. You might be afraid of standing in lines or being in crowds. So you're basically just afraid of like any situation is, uh, is what I get from agoraphobics, right? So that's agoraphobia. Uh, in a nutshell. Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. So OCD is going to involve two things. You have the obsessions or the intrusive, unwanted thoughts about something, and then you have the repeated behavior, which is the compulsion. So great example of OCD would be like leaving the house and having to make sure that all the doors are locked, right? but you do it repeatedly. Like, it's not just enough for you to check the door is locked once, then you have to check it again, you have to check it again, and then you keep on doing that over and over and over again. So that would be the obsession, the obsessive intrusive thoughts that the door might be unlocked, and then the compulsive behavior, and the compulsive behavior helps to kind of relieve the anxiety of the intrusive thoughts. That's why you do the compulsive behavior as well. And so those combined together is what results in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I might get sick of the germs on the doorknobs, so I clean the doorknobs in the house twice a day. Like, who does that? <laughs> but somebody with OCD might be a germaphobe, and then they might be, like, super concerned about cleaning things and keeping things as sanitized as possible. Unwanted thoughts, obsessions, 
uh, images and urges. Um, and then you relieve that with those rituals or compulsions. So, um, by the way, equal between males and females, and thankfully pretty rare. What's up? There's lots of different types of OCD. But, but the hallmark of OCD in general is the obsessive thoughts and then the compulsive actions to relieve those obsessive thoughts. So it doesn't matter what subtype you have. So long as you have both of those things combined, that's when you have OCD. What's up? So long as it's not like intruding in your day-to-day -day activities. That happens to me sometimes too. Like I've had moments where I get into my car, I'm like, did I lock the door? And then I'll go back to check if I locked the door. And lo and behold, usually I lock the door, right? But that doesn't make me OCD. I don't do that all the time. If I did that every single day, that would be OCD, right? Every single time I got in my car, if I had anxiety about having not locked the door and went to go check, that would be OCD, right? So it's normal to have those behaviors every so often, but if you constantly have it and it's interfering with your day-to-day -day activities, then that's a problem. Pete, what's up? No, no, definitely not. It's an intrusive thought that you might have forgot, but it's not actually having truly forgot. Usually it's a person that did not forget to lock the door, for example, but they keep on having to go back to check. Wow. She, she, that's what she told you? She feels like her family is literally going to die if she doesn't... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally irrational. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. That's a really good example. All right, now let's talk about PTSD. So post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the reason why I put this here involving like veterans, you see this a lot in veteran uh, uh, cohorts, right? So combat veterans and even first responders, you're going to see a lot of first responders developing PTSD. So that could be police officers, it could be EMT, fire fighters, anyone that does like first responder type work could develop PTSD just from witnessing hor horrific tragedies. Um, <clears throat> so it occurs after witnessing or participating in an event that has caused severe harm. So this can happen to somebody who does something that they did not know that they were capable of, capable of doing before. So for example, military soldiers, right? Um, having killed somebody in combat could induce a, a PTSD in the person. Or witnessing somebody getting killed in cab combat, that can induce PTSD. So it could be the thing that they did themselves, or it could be the thing that they witnessed somebody else do. Both of those can cause PTSD. Um, it could also be victims of trauma, victims of sexual assault. That's very common for uh, people who you know, suffer from sexual assault to uh, develop PTSD as a consequence. And so those are all things that could happen with PTSD. Um, you get recurrence of the event, right? So that's going to be something that you, you're, you ruminate over the event and it induces a stress response. Remembering the event will induce a stress response. And then they have difficulty sleeping and then they get the bruxism, they get the chewing, they can even maybe develop like TMJ because they're grinding their teeth in their, in their sleep. Those are all signs and symptoms of PTSD. You got a question? Yeah. He developed PTSD from witnessing all those. Yeah, that's, that is so sad. And he committed suicide because of all the stuff that he saw. Yeah, that's so sad. 
Oh, that's so sad. And that happens a lot with soldiers too, right? Because like right now, uh, you see a lot of like PTSD patients in the VA, right? And uh, it's really hard to treat. Thankfully, though, there's a lot of new treatment modalities that are coming out. So MAPS, which is uh, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, I believe is what it's called. They are in their phase three or phase four clinical trials of MDMA therapy for PTSD patients. So MDMA, uh, also known as Molly, right? MDMA is going to be a serotonergic type comp. Oh, it releases a lot of serotonin, so it makes the person feel comfortable, at ease, and relaxed. And so you can use it as an adjunct for therapy. So it makes individuals who experience trauma to be able to now face those experiences and talk through those experiences. So those treatments actually have a very high efficacy compared to like the traditional uh, therapies. Traditional therapies for PTSD suck. They do not do very well. Um, so anyways, uh, let's go through these real quick before we continue on because we have only 15 minutes. So um, worrying about bills, what kind of anxiety would that be? Constant unsubstantiated worry. Okay, so that'd be generalized anxiety disorder, but embarrassment, self uh, self consciousness, etc. What would that be? Yeah, so it'd be a social phobia, out of the blue panic attacks, so panic disorder, uh, realistic fears of dangerous objects or situations uh, versus irrational fears. So if you have irrational fears of uh, an object or situation, so that'd be a specific phobia. Don't worry about or. Um, Performing uncontrollable repetitive actions. OCD, good. And then recurrent nightmares, flashbacks, emotional numbing after a traumatic event. That's going to be PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. All right, let's move on because we have little amount of time. Um, depression. So different types of depression. There's major depressive disorder. There's also like conditions like manic depression. Jimi Hendrix has a really awesome song called Manic Depression, these are the lyrics for that song. I included the link for you to listen to the song if you want to. It's a great track. Jimi Hendrix is awesome, one of my favorite guitar players. Um, depression, it's going to be marked by sadness, apathy. Uh, so anhedonia is kind of like apathy and the inability to experience pleasure, anhedonia. Um, weight loss, uh, weight changes. So it could be weight loss, or it could also be weight gain. So that'd be one of the things that you want to ask for. Decreased energy, so being tired all the time, being fatigued, lethargic, maybe staying in bed for too long, sleeping for too long. Obviously, suicidal thoughts or thoughts of hurting yourself, um, changes in mood, uh, inability to sleep at night, uh, crying for really no reason, being unprovoked and like you know, crying. Those are all things that would be associated with depression. Um, so there's different types of depression, right? The most devastating of them are, will be the major depressive disorder, or MDD. Major depressive disorder uh, is going to uh, be the most severe one. It's going to affect different aspects of your life, such as being able to work. It might affect your job, might affect your relationships. It's going to affect your eating habits. Um, other ones that are worth mentioning would be postpartum depression. So postpartum, after the child is born, the mom can develop depression because of that. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be the case, but some of that might be because of hormonal changes. Because while the baby's developing in the womb, you've got lots of different hormones, you know, flooding the body, right, as the baby's developing. Progesterone, of course, to you know, provide uh, the endometrial lining for the uterus as the baby develops. And then when the baby is born, those hormones kind of go back to your baseline. And because of that, that might cause depression after childbirth. Seasonal affective disorder. Um, I get that. I moved to Oregon when I finished my undergrad, and I lived there for like two years. And I got so insanely depressed during the winter months because there was like no sunlight. It would get dark at like 3.30 in the afternoon. And when I was working, I would go to work. It was dark. I would leave work. It was still dark, right? I didn't see the sun, sunlight. And coming from Arizona, we had lots of sunlight. And so uh, seasonal affective disorder, especially in northern and super south latitudes, you're going to see seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. And then dysthymia. Dysthymia is not as bad 
it's not as severe, but you have like this depression that goes for a long time. So if a person has kind of like depression type symptoms and it's for over two years, that person can be diagnosed as being dysthymic or dysthymia. So what's going on with depression? There's lots of stuff that causes depression. It could have to do, it could do, sorry, it could be related to serotonergic uh, pathways, but there's some debate about how much that actually affects depression, but it's kind of up in the air. But serotonin could be underlying uh, depression. That's why SSRIs are really commonly used. Serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, could be situational, right? So a person maybe is undergoing a mourning process due to the death of a loved one. So that's normal, right? So it could be a situational, temporary uh, depression. Could be induced by drugs. So drugs could cause depression as well. And so how do you uh, test for it? You do the Siggy caps, which we're going to talk about in a second. Siggy caps so you can see how well they're sleeping, if there's any weight gain, weight changes, uh, if they feel like sentiments of guilt, if they had thoughts about suicide. We'll talk about all that in Siggy caps in a sec. You want to rule out um, organic causes. Like, for example, if a person is hypothyroid, they're going to have a lot of similar symptoms, right? They're going to be tired, lethargic. They're going to have weight changes. They're going to have weight gain, right? So it could look like depression, but in reality, it's a thyroid disorder, right? And then normal grieving. Uh, normal grieving within a certain window of time is normal. After a certain window of per uh, window period, then you start getting into depression territory if it goes on for too long. And I include this article here because this came out last year. It was a it was a meta analysis on the serotonergic model and a lot of studies are, are saying that there's actually really not much evidence to conclusively say that serotonin imbalance is actually the underlying cause of depression. So read that article. This is a, it's a good read. It came out last year, and it really brought up a lot of concerns about psychiatric practice because antidepressants, one in eight people are taking them. It's a very commonly prescribed drug. Is it helping? Not really. People are still as depressed as ever. Here is a questionnaire that you can take to see how severe your depression might be. Again, like I said, you can do this on your own time. If you have any of these symptoms for depression, go get a therapist. Um, I've had therapists in the past for myself. Lots of my friends have had therapists. It really helps if you're experiencing depression. So don't try to self-medicate like a lot of people do. So people try to self-medicate, and it doesn't help. So sometimes you want to go see somebody, a professional, to help you through whatever issues that you're facing. SIGI CAPS, it's the acronym for changes in sleep, loss of interest in things, if you have feelings of guilt for whatever reason, um, loss of energy, um, difficulty concentrating, changes in appetite, psychomotor uh, depression, and suicidal ideation. That is SIGI CAPS. So if you have those, then the patient possibly has major depressive disorder. You want to ask those in the interview with the patient. All right, so let's talk about bipolar disorder. As I mentioned, I'm not going to test you guys on bipolar, so I'm going to kind of blast through this because uh, I want to get to depression. Or Sorry, I want to get to schizophrenia. But I want to point out that bipolar 1 is the more severe form of bipolar disorder. Bipolar 1 is going to be marked by a manic episode that lasts for longer than seven days. And when a person has mania... They are absolutely bonkers, right? They're going to have crazy flights of idea. They're going to have delusions of grandeur. They think they're like invincible on top of the world. They might go on shopping sprees and spend all their money. They might go on sex binges and just like have sex with anything that moves. They can destroy their marriages because of that. I've seen that happen to people where it literally destroys a marriage. The, the partner, whatever, the spouse will go into a manic episode and just be completely promiscuous horrible situation. Um, they can go into drug binges. They can like do every drug underneath the sun for the whole entire week. Then when the mania is over, they go into depression. And the depression is really, really severe. So they go from the most ecstatic state of mania all the way down to the lowest feelings that they could possibly feel, right? They hit rock bottom. And by that time, they ruined their marriage. They spent all their money. They've done all sorts of self-harm behavior, and they have a very high risk of suicide. 
at that point. So suicidality is really one of the most concerning things with bipolar depression. Bipolar 2 is not as bad. Bipolar 2, you have hypomania. And that means you have manic episode that goes for about four days. Generally, those people don't get hospitalized. These ones do get hospitalized. Bipolar 1 individuals get hospitalized. Why did I include all these famous people? Some of the most famous, successful people in the world have bipolar 2. <laughs> so Winston Churchill famously had bipolar. Uh, Russell Brand, bipolar. Uh, Robin Williams, besides having Lewy body dementia, which ultimately led to his demise at the end of his life, he also had bipolar disorder. Lots of really famous people have bipolar disorder. And with the hypomania especially, that makes those people like really motivated to do stuff, right? If it gets to a manic state, then it's kind of productive, right? But a hypomanic state is actually kind of good. They become a very productive individual. They can work on really cool projects, whether it's like artistic or creative type projects. So I included all this here for from the DSM-5 that you know shows you all the different diagnostics for uh, a manic episode. And then, as I mentioned, bipolar 1 is going to be the most severe of bipolar. Uh, Russell Brand is pretty open about his bipolar. Um, dude did lots of drugs. Dude was very promiscuous, ruined so many of his relationships. And a lot of that has to do with like his underlying bipolar disorder. So this is a very common theme in a lot of uh, you know, famous people, famous artists in the world. And unfortunately, uh, suicide risk is one of the highest, one of the biggest concerns but also um, harm to others. People that are manic, they can be very dangerous too. So they're not only so causing self-harm, but they can also harm other people too. So risk of homicide is actually pretty, pretty significant when a person's having a, a manic ep episode with bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar 2 is going to be more common than bipolar 1. And um, generally the outcomes, there's lots of drugs that you can take, like lithium, Lamotrigine, mood stabilizers, those drugs can help people. But guess what? A lot of people with bipolar don't like to take those drugs. Because why? Huh? They like to be manic. Because when you're manic, you feel good, right? You're like on top of the world. And if you take those mood stabilizers, now it's all boring and normal, right? And so it's really hard to treat bipolar patients because they do not like to take their meds. They don't want to be uh, feeling sedated, right? Same thing with schizophrenia. Um, and yeah, the outcomes, they can live pretty normal lives, right? They can live normal lives. You're not always going to be manic. You're not always going to be super depressed. Um, as a matter of fact, that couple that I was telling about where the, the spouse, she was like having these weird sex capades, like her husband is still with her. And she's, they're actually kind of like normal now, but he is a very patient man. He actually stuck it through with her. So some people, you know, if you have loved ones that have bipolar, you have to be very patient with them. So you can live a normal life. You're not always going to be manic, but you, it's a good idea to take the meds so you prevent those manic episodes from taking place. I'm not going to make you guys do this quiz. I just put these questions in there just to, you know, help you learn more about bipolar disorder. But you're not going to be tested on it. I'm not going to put it on your exam. Any questions, though, on bipolar? All right. Let's talk about schizophrenia, one of my favorite disorders. Um, not because it's, you know, it's del delightful to have schizophrenia, but it's just fascinating. Some of the most interesting patients I worked with when I was doing my clinicals were patients with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, specifically schizoaffective disorder with a bipolar subtype. Schizoaffective looks a lot like schizophrenia, but it's not, it's different. It's a little bit different. But schizoaffective patients are awesome. They're very funny. Actually, <laughs> I'm not testing you on schizoaffective disorder, but I remember when I was doing my clinicals, uh, there was a bunch of us med students, and then the doc, the psychiatrist was interviewing a patient. This patient came in just, like, hilarious. Everything they said was just, like, ridiculously funny. And then they, the patient left, and the doc looked at us. He's like, so what's their diagnosis? Do you guys know? And I'm like, uh, schizoaffective, bipolar subtype. And he's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and he's like, how would you know that? I'm like, patient was hilarious. <laughs> like everything they said was just like completely wild and just like, you know, uh, out of pocket. <laughs> so there, these, these patients can be very interesting, but it's also uh, very devastating, right? So schizophrenia is extremely devastating. Um, I included this quote here because, uh, yeah, it's extremely devastating to people that get affected. No other disorder arouses as much anxiety in the general public, the media, and doctors. 
It is a very serious mental illness. I wouldn't wish schizophrenia on it, my worst enemy. It's absolutely horrendous. Um, but it's also been something that's inspired a lot of amazing art, a lot of amazing uh, music, amazing paintings. Uh, Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a fantastic story, right? If you've seen the movie, that should suffice with Jack Nicholson. And then here's Sid Barrett. If, you, if any of you like Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett was the first singer, songwriter, guitar player of Pink Floyd back in the late 60s. He became schizophrenic. He was doing lots of LSD. He was smoking way too much marijuana at the time. And, uh, and psych psychedelic drugs like LSD, psilocybin, things like that, if you have a predisposition for mental health issues, especially if you have it in your family history, you should avoid those drugs like the plague because those drugs could potentially induce schizophrenia. Same thing with marijuana. Heavy marijuana use in a person who has a family history of mental health diseases, those patients should avoid marijuana use at all costs because you could develop schizophrenia or it could trigger psychosis in those patients. So this is Sid Barrett before when he was in Pink Floyd. This is Sid Barrett after he like lost his mind. He like shaved all of his hair off, shaved his eyebrows. He eventually became a recluse. He lived with, at home with his mom for the rest of his life until he died. He died when? It was like 2012 or something like that. It was like a little bit over 10 years ago. Super sad story. Amazing guy with amazing music. Um, inspired the rest of the band to do like all their other albums like Dark Side of the Moon. All that stuff was inspired by Sid Barrett. But uh, yeah, so. Um, here's a fun one. I didn't have a chance to show this to my pre-med students, but I'll show this to you. My colleague, Dr. Jackson, showed me, um, sent this to me the other day. But this is an artist back in the 1800s who developed schizophrenia. And you'll see how his drawings of cats evolved <laughs> throughout the duration of his like disorder. So at first, they started kind of normal. And then like uh, over time, they just became crazier and crazier looking. Super cool. So here's the video. Let me play it. They don't even look like cats anymore towards the end, so <laughs> super interesting. So you have like distortions of perception. And speaking of cats, for all of you cat lovers out there, um, toxoplasmosis is something that is transmitted through cat feces. Um, toxoplasmosis is a protozoan organism, so it's a parasite. And what toxoplasmosis does is that if you breathe it in, it can cause changes in your behavior and personality. So for mice and for rats and rodents, when a rodent breathes in toxoplasmosis, it actually makes the rodent more attracted to the scent of cat urine. So now, instead of being scared from, of cat urine, because that's usually the normal response for a rodent, they'll run away when they smell cat urine, all of a sudden now they have a higher affinity to it. And they think, oh wow, it's a cat. Let's go play with the cat. So then they play with the cat. The cat plays with the rodent. And then the cat eventually eats the rodent. And then now the cat is going to have toxoplasmosis. So it's a parasite that actually changes the behavior of rodents. And it can also affect humans too. So for humans, uh, toxoplasmosis is really bad for pregnant moms. If you work in obstetrics and you're working with a pregnant mom and she owns cats, tell her not to change the kitty litter herself, have somebody else do it for her because that's how you get toxoplasmosis. You're breathing in the toxoplasmosis from the cat droppings. So it can be teratogenic to the child. It can also affect the child's immune system. So it can actually like interfere with like IgG's immunoglobulins that cross the placenta. So it's bad for the kid. Um, and if a person has AIDS, HIV AIDS, if they're immunocompromised, that's a one of the AIDS-defining illnesses is actually toxoplasmosis, and it can cause some severe uh, cerebral damage to immunocompromised patients. Um, now, for adults that are not pregnant and are just normal, like the rest of us, uh, if you get exposed to toxoplasmosis, you're familiar with like the crazy cat lady, right? So the crazy cat lady trope is actually pretty, you know, it's legit. Uh, it can cause mood changes in women, so it makes women a little bit more like erratic, kind of weird. For men, it actually makes men more aggressive 
So it can actually induce mood changes in adults. It can also predispose individuals to schizophrenia. So yeah, so anyways, I'm sorry cat lovers in here. I'm not much of a cat person, so I find this very amusing. But for the cat lovers in here, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Moving on. That was a total side note. I am not going to test you on that, but I just thought it was very interesting to put it in. So schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a chronic disorder. Once you get diagnosed with it, um, you can improve. I'll talk about the rules of thirds in a little bit, but generally you're going to be living with it for the rest of your life. And it is, depending on the severity of it, it can be extremely disabling. What are the causes? Uh, lots of things can cause it. It's multifactorial. So you could be, it could be genetic. There's actually a really great book that came out in uh, 20, 2021. No, 2020. It came out in 2020. It's called Hidden Valley Road. If you like to read, <laughs> right, make a note of it, if you're, especially if you're interested in like behavioral um, health. The book is really good. And it talks about this family where they had 14 kids. 12 of those children had schizophrenia. And so this was back in the 1950s slash 1960s. And so like psychiatrists were really interested in studying this family. And the story is so sad. Like the older brothers that had schizophrenia would like sexually assault the younger sisters. The older one of the older brothers eventually murdered his girlfriend and committed suicide. Like horrible tragedies in this whole family. And uh, really amazing. Like the whole entire story is wild, but it, ta it, it basically indicates that there's definitely a genetic component to schizophrenia. What genes are involved, they're still doing research on it, so it's not fully known. But family history is gonna be important when it comes to schizophrenia. Um, genetic, right, fam family history, and then environment, right? So there's nature and nurture. So environmental issues can also affect schizophrenia. There's been studies that show that individuals that live in like urban environments or individuals that live in those higher alt not higher altitude, but um, what's it called? Nor Northern latitudes, Southern latitudes, right? They don't get enough sunlight. There's been uh, links between vitamin D deficiency and developing schizophrenia. And so individuals that are vitamin D deficient could potentially develop schizophrenia. Um, there's been links with certain types of viruses that mom might get while she's pregnant that can induce schizophrenia in the child when the child is older. So there's actually been uh, studies that show that individuals that are born during the winter months tend to have a higher rate of developing schizophrenia later on. So it could be because of vitamin D with the winter months, or it could be due to cold and flu season. Who knows? There's lots of different things that could potentially predispose a person to schizophrenia. Very interesting area of research, right, to figure out what is actually going on. But what's the pathophysiology? This is what we do know. It's going to be involving dopamine. So if you have way too much dopamine, you have way too much excitation of like the dopamine pathways, that's going to cause psychosis. And so that's kind of like the underlying cause of schizophrenia. There's other neurotransmitters that could be involved as well. So like, hold on one second. Um, you can get like glutamate uh, involvement, GABA, acetylcholine, serotonin could also be involved. But dopamine is the big thing. What are the signs and symptoms? So you can have positive symptoms and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are going to be things like hallucinations. And hallucinations are usually going to be auditory. They're going to hear things. Sometimes they hear voices. Sometimes those voices can be really intrusive. Like they could be command type voices, like voices of demons telling them to like kill people. Right? So those are the type of, they can have like really bad hallucinations like that. Or it could be other just like, you know, annoying type of, uh, voices in their head. And so those are the types of hallucinations they can see with auditory, or they can see visual hallucinations. Usually not as common to get visual hallucinations, but it happens. I've had lots of patients that had florid psychosis where they were seeing stuff. Like they would see demons in the walls and all sorts of really crazy stuff. Really amazing. Um, so those are positive symptoms. Negative symptoms are going to be a little bit different. Negative symptoms are going to be flat affect. So the person might just sit there, zero expression on their face. They have like emotional blunting. They don't respond emotionally to anything. Um, they could have poverty of speech. They don't really talk much. They could be socially withdrawn. So positive symptoms are going to be more like delusions, hallucinations, maybe movements, whereas the negative symptoms are going to be more like you observe the person's kind of being socially withdrawn. They're not talking much. 
so flat affect. Those are going to be your negative symptoms. Um, here is the DSM-5 uh, diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. Um, <clears throat> continuous signs of disturbances are going to persist for at least six months. You can have brief psychotic episodes that are acute, and they happen, and then they go away, and you go back to normal. That's not schizophrenia. You have to have those symptoms lasting for at least six months to actually be diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, <clears throat> prognosis. This is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is really sad. One-third of people get better. One-third of people stay the same. And then the final third of people get worse. They don't recover. And they get worse and worse and worse. I mean, go down the street, you'll see a lot of homeless people. And oftentimes, they'll be talking to themselves, right? Sometimes they're on drugs as well. But a lot of like homelessness, that's a lot of it has to do with like schizophrenia and behavioral health issues. And then a lot of people who, who are schizophrenic will also self-medicate with drugs too. So it's like it makes it worse. Makes it worse and worse. So you had a question? Yeah, some people can get a brief psychotic episode. Sometimes it sometimes it's just random. It sometimes it has nothing to do with drugs. Like my a colleague, I haven't uh, really seen this kind of scenario per se, but my colleague has, and he talks about this story. He was working in emergency medicine, and they had a patient come in. This lady, she was fluidly psychotic, and she was combative. She actually like punched the nurse in the face. <laughs> the nurse punched her back. <laughs> Don't hit your patients. <laughs> but anyways, so all that happened. They restrained her. They took her blood. They're like, oh, this lady's got to be on drugs or something like that. The labs came back cleared. No drugs. Because they were all like, she's got to be on like methamphetamines or something. Nothing. Perfectly lucid. Crazy the entire night. The next day, snapped out of it. Total amnesia. Didn't remember anything that happened. She was like, where the hell am I? What happened? They told her what, what was going on, and she was like, I had no idea what was going on. She, the patient, was actually a nurse, it turns out. She was actually a nurse, and she was totally fine her whole entire life until that one moment where she had a brief psychotic episode. So that can happen, where you have like a moment of psychosis, and then you go back to normal. It might not even they had no idea why it happened. Could have been a trick. Something might have triggered it. Who knows? But yeah, your guess is as good as mine with that. So that does happen for some people. And they can go back to reliving their normal lives. They might never ever get that episode again. I would imagine that they would have a higher likelihood of getting those episodes again later on if it happens once. But there's a, there's a really interesting TED talk that I should put, I should have put the link in here. I'll put the link in there for future lectures. But there's a TED talk of a professor uh, when she was an undergrad. She started developing schizophrenia, but it's the she um, also had a lot of social support. I put it over here. The biopsychosocial model of mental illness is really important to consider. So your, your mental health is going to be a combination of your biology, your psychological predispositions, and your social relationships. So if you have a biological predisposition for something, maybe you have like a family history of psychosis, but if you have a good psychological balance, right, if your head is on straight, if you have good social relationships, those are protective factors against your biological predispositions, right? There's another really good story of a guy who, uh, Dr. Jim Fallon, not to be confused with the comedian, but Dr. Jim Fallon is a neuroscientist, and he was studying the brains of psychopaths, and so he would do, like, functional MRIs, and he would find that there was reduction in frontal lobe activity, so... Uh, then he did a brain scans of his whole family. And then he was looking through the brain scans. He was like, oh, my God, this one looks like a brain of a psychopath. And so he thought that his grad students were joking with him. They maybe slipped one in there just to joke with him. And so he asked his students, like, whose brain is this? Is this, like, is this one of my family members? It was actually his brain scan. So he had the brain of a psychopath. But he also had a good upbringing as a child. He had a strong support network that he, you know, good family members that helped him through his out, throughout his life. He had a good job as a researcher and a uh, neuro, neuroscientist. So all those things were protective factors. 
But if he was beaten as a child or if other things were you know, going haywire in his life, he might be more inclined to act on his psychotic, uh, uh, you know, psychotic, what do you call it? If you like an inclination towards a psychotic type of behavior, he might be more inclined to work, uh, act on it. Same thing with schizophrenia. There's another, I forget her name, uh, but she's a professor now, but when she was an undergrad, she started developing schizophrenia, uh, but she had a really good, strong support network. So her family, her friends, they all came to her help to be able to help her overcome schizophrenia. She still gets psychotic episodes, so it still happens. But because she has good friends, good family, good people to support her, she has, uh, she has uh, the ability to overcome her uh, schizophrenia. It's a great TED Talk. I'm going to maybe put a link in the announcement so you guys can watch it because it's really, really good. All right, so testing. It's going to be a clinical test, right? You're going like, to observe the patient and then you, you know, see what kind of symptoms they actually have. And like I said, you want to rule out other underlying causes, like, for example, drugs. So, let's see, what time is it? We got time. For this. this video is so weird. This is catatonic uh, type schizophrenia. So you get the picture. <laughs> so that makes no sense whatsoever. So uh, very disorganized thought process. It makes no sense whatsoever that he's like acting like different people and the fact that he's playing piano or whatever. So that's an example of just disorganized thought process. Um, and then he's got that flat affect, right? He doesn't really have much of an emotional response whatsoever when he's speaking. And also paucity of speech. He doesn't really have much in terms of like, you know, he really has to be pressed hard to actually answer a question. So that's uh, some good examples of uh, schizophrenic, a lot of negative symptoms in that. And when he pauses and he's like thinking, a lot of times it looks like he's kind of internally preoccupied. Uh, when a person is internally preoccupied, if you ask somebody a question and they're just like staring off into space and they have schizophrenia, it's, it's very possible that they're hearing things. So they might be listening to the voices in their head. 
And so they might be internally preoccupied by listening to the voices in their head. Or if they're seeing things, they might just be preoccupied like observing the distortions of reality around them. So that's a really, I love that video. It's really interesting. Like, poor kid, uh, you know, really sad, but also very fascinating, too. I'm not going to play this video. This is just like a guy that's experienced all sorts of weird psychotic, uh, schizophrenic hallucinations and things like that. Watch that video on your own time. It's pretty interesting. So you can kind of like get a feel for, you know, the things that people might hear when they're having schizophrenia, like weird voices and all that sort of stuff, distortions of perception. And also delusions, too. There's lots of types of delusions, some of which are like persecutory delusions. Like, my neighbor, I swear my neighbor is a CIA agent, and they're, they're tapping my phones, and they're listening to my conversations, and they're trying to get me arrested because, you know, uh, they think I'm working for the Russians or something like that. Those are actual type of, like, scenarios where people will think that they're being persecuted. Um, they might also have, uh, like, uh, delusions that they're being communicated uh, to through things like the telephone or through the TV. They're like, oh, the person on the TV is communicating to me. So they'll think that they're getting messages, secret messages from like the person on the television. Or something like that. These are all different types of delusions, and those would be symptoms of schizophrenia and psychosis. These are other disorders that you are not responsible for but are all very interesting. So schizophrenia we just talked about. Schizoaffective disorder is where you have schizophrenia plus something else. So there's two major types. There's going to be schizoaffective depressive subtype. So they have schizophrenia plus depression. Or they might be schizoaffective bipolar subtype. Those are the ones that are really, like, really interesting to speak with because they have lots of crazy stories that are kind of interesting and fun. <laughs> uh, schizotypal personality, that's a person that has really weird thought process. So odd behavior. Sometimes they dress really strange. They just look very odd. Um, schizoid personality, these are people that would live out in the middle of the mountains by themselves and they want to avoid all social contact altogether. So that would be a schizoid personality disorder. Um, schizophreniform, it's like schizophrenia, but it's not six months. So it's less than six months. And then the brief psychotic disorder that I was talking to you about, that's going to be something that happens acutely. It lasts a short period of time, but then you go back to normal. You go right back to baseline as if nothing ever happened. All right, any questions on schizophrenia? So we have, we have time. So let's talk about autistic, or autism spectrum disorder, or autism. <clears throat> so autistic spectrum disorder, this is kind of a new thing. That's part of like the whole new DSM-5. Before the DSM-5, um, autism was separate from Asperger's. Now it's all lumped up together. Now it's all part of like the autistic spectrum disorder which I find kind of annoying because patients with Asperger's are so different than patients that have autism. And I've worked with autism for years when I was younger. There was a kid that I worked with for like almost two years. And he spoke, within that period of time, he spoke five words to me. Like he did not, he doesn't speak at all. That's like severe autism. Asperger's are highly functioning individuals. Sometimes you don't even know that they have any sort of mental health issue. They might be kind of quirky. They might have like really weird like obsessions and you know idiosyncrasies. But by and large, they're going to be pretty normal. They fun they're highly functioning individuals. I worked with lots of people that had Asperger's, but now Asperger's is going to be lumped up under autistic spectrum disorder. And so, what's going on? Autism is a spectrum, and everyone that's going to have autism is going to present with different types of symptoms. Some are going to be more severe than others. There are, like I said, there's going to be people that cannot function whatsoever. They don't speak. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't participate or do any of their activity of daily living. And there's going to be other ones that are not really that severe whatsoever. They can live normal lives. I have a couple of students that told me that they have autism. They're fine. They're doing actually pretty well. They're, they get good grades, right? But they just have some social quirks. Some people with autism are going to have excellent vocabulary and high IQ, but they might not be really good at communicating with people. They might have, they might be like socially awkward, right? They don't really have good communication skills. They might not have good people skills. So they might have a high IQ, but they might not really be able to engage very well. But if you have really severe autism, you might also have a low IQ and you might become nonverbal because of all that. So it really just depends on how severe the person's autism is. 
Um, that video is really long. Do you guys want to watch it? Yeah? Okay, let's watch it. We'll watch parts of it. If it gets boring, I'll stop it. No, I won't be helpful. Almost everyone with the same general developmental milestones learns the same sets of skills at about the same time, more or less. These are things like language and communication, socializing, cognitive skills like problem solving, and physical milestones like walking, crawling, and fine motor skills, all of which progress as the brain develops. If one of these doesn't develop by schedule, depending on the severity, it may be described as a type of neurodevelopmental disorder, neuro referring to the brain, especially when certain skills related to socializing and communication don't receive this mobility, it can result in isolation, which is where the name autism originated, since auto means self. So autism refers to a condition where somebody might be removed from social interaction or communication leaving them a little over isolated. Before 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the Mental Disorder, the fourth edition, or the DSM-4, described autism as one of several pervasive developmental disorders, which also includes Asperger's Syndrome, Childhood Disintegrated Disorder, and those not otherwise specified, or PDD and OS. Asperger's Syndrome was used for children that appear to have characteristics of autism, like difficulties with social interactions or nonverbal communication, but don't generally have significant delays in language or cognitive development. And therefore, Asperger's syndrome was sometimes referred to as a high functioning form of autism. Childhood disintegrated disorder was used to describe the late onset of developmental delays. So these children develop normally for their age, but then they seem to lose the acquired social and communication skills sometime between. Pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, is essentially a catch-all category in which patients meet some, but not all features of autism, Asperger's syndrome, or childhood disintegrated disorder. Researchers found, however, that separate diagnoses of these pervasive developmental disorders work consistent across different clinics, since they tend to have very similar signs and symptoms. As in 2013, the DSM-5, a new revised edition, Remove these terms and replace them with Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, which encompasses all the previous pervasive developmental disorders, but uses a scale, or a spectrum, that differentiates based on the severity of two major areas, social communication and interaction deficits, and restrictive or repetitive behavior, interests, and activities. For the social and communication area, there are four subcategories that clinicians look for deficits. The first is social reciprocity, which refers to how children respond or reciprocate in social interactions. So like how the behavior of one person influences the other, and vice versa. An example of impairment in this area might be referring to being alone and not taking a role in social games. The second area of potential deficit is joint attention, which is the state of wanting to share an interest with someone else. So it's like, hey, check out this awesome thing I found. So an example of impairment in this area might be a child not sharing their interests or amusement in an object with their parent. Next, there's nonverbal communication, which refers to difficulties either using nonverbal communication themselves or interpreting nonverbal cues from someone else. So maybe the child won't put their arms out when they want to be picked up, or maybe they won't be able to tell when parents are set, even if the parents are frowning and crossing their arms. The last subcategory of communication deficits is in social relationships. So children have trouble developing and maintaining relationships. So maybe the child has a hard time making friends, or they're able to make friends, but the behavior tends to drive the friends away. The other major area is called restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And this category is pretty broad. It can include a whole bunch of behaviors, some being more well-known or characterized than others, like lining up toys in a ritualistic sort of way, or slapping one's hands, or imitating words or phrases. The child might be fixed on certain routines, like taking the same route every day of school. Or they might have restricted patterns of interest, like having a very specific and in-depth knowledge of the Titanic or vacuum cleaner. So two comments on that. <clears throat> Individuals with autism hate breaking routines. They need to have consistency on a day-to-day -day basis. They like to have consistency. 
And then the last one over here, the specific knowledge, the most interesting patient that deals with this that I had was this young kid. This is when I was doing my, psych, my first psych rotation. And part of that psych hospital, we had a pediatric psych ward as well. There was this young kid. He was like 13 years old. And he had an encyclopedic knowledge of like every movie over the past like 50 years. Not just the title of the movie, the actors of the movie, the year that the movie was released. And I could just ask him any movie. I'd be like, I don't know, like Beetlejuice. And he'd be like, oh, 1985 or something like that. I'd be like, wow, that's crazy. Uh, Gone with the Wind. He would tell me like the actors, where, when it was released. Like insane amount of knowledge on something so unnecessary, <laughs> right? Like he had so much knowledge on this one thing. And everyone found him extremely annoying because he would only talk about like that one little tiny narrow uh, area of interest. I thought it was really interesting. So I don't know. That's my side note on that little specific knowledge. Children with autism spectrum disorder might exhibit one or more of these deficits and vary in how severe the deficit is. With that in mind, it's important to remember that each child with autism spectrum disorder is going to have a different spectrum of symptoms and deficits. Typically, clinicians will try to observe these behaviors in a child looking for these possible deficits. Since these behaviors are often more well known by the child's caretakers than they are by the clinicians, like their parents or their teachers, a meaningful diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder relies heavily on listening to what others are observing at home or in school. They might be given severity scores in each area, which can help determine how much support the child is going to need. For example, a severity level 1 would indicate the child needs some support. For social communication, they might speak in full sentences and engage in communication, but normal back and forth conversation with others just doesn't seem to work. For repetitive and restrictive behaviors, they might have difficulty switching between activities. On the other side of the spectrum, the level 3 severity means the child needs very substantial support. And on the social communication side, they might display very few words of intelligible speech and rarely initiate an interaction with others. For repetitive behaviors, they might be extremely resistant to change, and their behaviors seriously interfere with their daily life. It's not that using this scale of symptoms as opposed to differentiating between the basic developmental disorders will help give a more accurate and medically useful way to diagnose it. For example, those with what was previously described as Asperger's syndrome would likely fall closer to severity level 1 than severity level 8. Generally speaking, autism spectrum disorders not have a genetic cause, which ultimately affects brain development, specifically areas that affect social and communication behavior. Which genes or a combination of genes that are affected in autism spectrum disorder, though, is still very much a mystery. In addition, there are a bunch of environmental triggers that have to be explored, but at the moment there are no clear risk factors that have been identified. With that said, there is also no cure for autism spectrum disorder, and treatment or management has to be specifically and carefully tailored to each child. And this includes things like specialized education programs and behavior therapy that all seek to maximize quality of life and functional independence. Right. That's a great video. I'm glad we actually watched that whole thing. So, ah, that being said, it is time for us to depart. Um, we will continue with uh, autism on Friday, and then we'll do some quizzes, questions, and that's going to be it for the week. We're, we'll do some, like, uh, neurological stuff, too, like dementia we'll cover as well. So we'll continue everything on Friday. Y'all have a wonderful day. Cool. So <laughs> let's uh, continue where we left off last time. So last time we watched that video on autistic, our autism spectrum disorder. Um, and back in the day, DSM-4, recall that there was other conditions that were a little bit separate, right? like Asperger's, for example. But now everything is lumped up together under autism spectrum disorder. And so there's a spectrum because it's like varying degrees of severity. Right? There's some people who have autism, and they can function perfectly normal. Right? They have normal cognition for the most part. They have a normal IQ. Right? Sometimes they can even have some skills that are surprising, like autistic savants. 
right? It's not very common for that to be the case, by the way. There are some people who are autistic savants, but it, that's more rare. But there are really cool instances. You can actually watch them on YouTube. There's, there's a, there was an organization that worked with savants, and there were like, there were these kids that could listen to a song, and they could play it immediately on the piano. There was even this one video I remember watching a while ago where not just correct notes, but if you, they, they would hit like a ton of incorrect notes, and the, this autistic savant could hear all the incorrect notes and reproduce every single one of those incorrect notes, even though it sounded terrible, right? But he could hear every single note that was played incorrectly on the piano. So there are those cases, but they're fringe cases. For the most part, um, you're either going to be kind of normal or you're going to be extremely cognitively uh, uh, abnormal, I guess if that's one way to put it. So there's going to be some extreme disabilities, right? Um, and then you're going to see moving fo uh, further towards like the realm of normalcy. You, you can get like normal IQ. And then those are rare, rare cases where you have an individual with some extremely interesting talents, right? So those are your savants, which is not usually the case, or it's a very rare fringe case. Um, what are the things that autistic um, individuals who suffer from autism experience? So they're going to have difficulties engaging socially, right? So they're going to tend to be a little socially awkward. Um, last time when we met, I mentioned that I, when I was younger, I actually worked with a guy with autism. At the time, I was 19. He was probably 17. So he was only a couple of years younger than me. And uh, I worked with him for about a year and a half. And during that whole period of time, he spoke, I think, a total of five words to me. And he was very non-communicative, very, like, a very difficult time maintaining eye contact if you tried to, like, speak with him. Uh, if you'd be speaking to him, sometimes, like, halfway through, he would just walk away from you. <laughs> and... He would lock himself up in the bathroom and like take a really long shower. Sometimes he would have bursts of anger, fits of anger. Um, one day, he, his mother told me that overnight, while the, him, her and her husband were sleeping in bed, they woke up to scorpion bites because the kid grabbed a scorpion and put it into his parents' bed while they were sleeping. So he would do all sorts of weird stuff. Um, so he had a really hard time engaging socially. So a very difficult time with eye contact, communication skills are, were lacking severely. Um, delayed or no speech, right? For this case that I was working with, this uh, individual had very poor speech, barely spoke whatsoever. Um, if they do speak, sometimes they will repeat phrases over and over and over again. Um, so repetitive words or even repetitive gestures. So like um, sometimes a parent will notice that in their child, that the child maybe will like start rocking a lot. will have like this repetitive type of movements. So that could be uh, a, a symptom of autism. Um, perseverations as a term for a phrase that you constantly say over and over and over again. There was this one time I met a guy and what was his phrase? It was during like the shutdowns and like uh, coronavirus. And he was like, I don't remember what his exact phrasing was, but he would repeat the same exact phrase. He's like, like, oh, this, uh, this coronavirus thing is insane. I, I wish it would be over, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. It's horrible. Like, you know, it's a shame that we we're all going through this. Like, in like 10 minutes later, he said the exact same phrase. I'm like, uh huh. And then again, like a few minutes later, he said the exact same phrase. And I'm like, wow, that's really weird. That's perseveration. And you're repeating the same phrase over and over again. So some people had those kinds of like weird tics that would be associated with autism. Um, so rocking, humming, hand flapping, some weird rituals that the patient might have. Those are all things that you would see with a patient with autism. Um, one way that you can think of autism is that... Uh, the regions of your brain are not communicating with one another. That's one way to look at it. Um, another analogy that uh, is kind of interesting, that I don't know if it's actually true, but it's like a, a person with autism has sometimes maybe too many connections. 
between different regions in the brain. So uh, the whole entire uh, mechanism and pathophysiology of autism is so poorly understood, right? And that's one of the reasons why we don't really have a good treatment uh, modality for patients with autism. So hopefully someday in the future we'll you know arrive at a definitive understanding of what's actually going on with autism. But right now it's not really the case. So common behavioral and social behaviors with autistic spectrum disorder, poor eye contact, we already talked about this, difficulty with speaking, um, getting really upset, especially if you throw them off of their daily routine. People with autism love routines. That also goes with uh, patients with like Alzheimer's and dementia. Usually they'll like to have a routine. Right? The moment you throw them off of a routine, it can like, you know, make them feel really distressed. Same thing with individuals with autism. They like routines. They can overreact, right? so they can become overly emotional. Um, they could act impatiently, and a lot. Oftentimes, they're going to prefer to be by themselves. So they like social isolation. Hmm. Not all people with autism act the same way. Obviously, it's a spectrum. There's going to be some individuals that are more severely. Uh, affected than others, right? Some individuals might be pretty, pretty high functioning. Um, so people are going to display in different ways. They'll have different signs and symptoms. Um, <laughs> they are also less likely to lie, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, don't ask them if your outfit makes you look fat. <laughs> you probably won't like the answer. They will actually tell you truthfully and honestly <laughs> what they actually think. Um, so yeah, they can be very socially awkward in that regard. Um, there was a podcast I was listening to about this lady who had Asperger's. It was very severe Asperger's, and she had a really tough time being able to communicate with people because she would be very blunt about things. She would just like say whatever's on her mind, and she wouldn't have any sort of like, you know, sensation of remorse, or she didn't, she wasn't able to experience empathy for others. So she would just say things, and it would like make people really upset. So um, and then. Part of that podcast was talking about like different ways that you could potentially treat it. So like they were doing deep brain stimulation. And so for her, they actually did deep brain stimulation. And for the first time in her life, she was able to actually experience empathy for other people. That ended the moment they stopped the deep brain stimulation. So you can do like treatments like that to, you know, see if that will actually affect autism. But generally speaking, like I said, there's really not that many good treatment um, options available at this point. And they can't really recognize social cues. That's why they become very socially awkward. Um, they're not always going to be savants. There are some people that are going to be savants. And um, some people, depending on the severity, are still able to learn, right? They can occasionally have normal IQs, so they can function normally. All right, any questions on autism? I think autism is really fascinating. So, you know, it's an interesting area of behavioral health and psychiatry. Um, hopefully, in the future, with more research, they're going to start understanding some of the mechanisms that are actually involved in autism, because it would be good to be able to treat those patients, um, because severe autism is really hard. It's really difficult to, to work with. All right, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorders. So there's going to be multiple different potential causes for ADHD. It could be genetic, right? So there, it could be something in the family, or maybe they're a mutation of some sort could trigger ADHD. Um, injuries, head injuries can cause ADHD. So I had a student who had a very severe motorcycle accident. So he had frontal lobe damage. And with frontal lobe damage, oftentimes individuals will start acting impulsively. They'll blurt out things when they when it would be like considered inappropriate. Right, to blurt out. So he was always kind of like, he was funny, so I didn't really mind so much, but he was pretty disruptive in my class. So he would like blurt things out just randomly. And uh, I was actually asking him, like, so did you notice any like behavioral changes after your motorcycle accident? He's like, yeah, definitely. I had some frontal lobe damage and I've been acting a little bit, you know, more impulsive <laughs> after the fact. So you can get uh, brain damage can cause symptoms of ADHD. So um, advanced paternal age. So the older the dad is, the more likely the kid might have different types of disorders, ADHD being one of them. Alcohol and tobacco use during pregnancy, especially alcohol, like fetal alcohol syndrome, very bad, right? So if mom is 
pregnant and drinking booze, especially around week eight, that's really bad for the developing child. Right? So, low birth weight and premature delivery could also be one of the underlying causes of ADHD. Um, things that are not causes that are kind of maybe thought to be cause of ADHD in pop culture, sugar, watching TV, uh, people who are uh, grow up like in lower socioeconomic conditions, poor parenting, those are not exactly things that cause ADHD. Okay, so that's kind of popular culture type of uh, causality. It's not an, not an actual thing. What's up? Is that she vaped a lot? Wait, 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 wait. The doctor told her to continue vaping while she was pregnant? That is so weird. And I don't know if that's how factually true that is, but who knows, this is the obstetrician, so the, the, the mom was instructed to continue smoking from her vape even though she was pregnant because it would have been potentially damaging to the child if she were to stop vaping, like put the kid into withdrawals or something. Man, that seems kind of bunk. <laughs> I don't know about that, uh, but I mean, I'm not your friend's obstetrician, so I mean, I would probably advise against that. That's my opinion. She should probably get a second opinion, <laughs> to be honest with you, because I don't know about that. So what was your question about alcohol, though? Would it be bad to stop drinking alcohol if you're pregnant? If somebody's an alcoholic, they need to stop drinking when they're pregnant. Like, they need to stop. And if they have to go into, like, an Ativan uh, therapy, which is a benzodiazepine to help prevent alcohol withdrawal symptoms, they should do that instead. But fetal alcohol syndrome? Um, let me give you a personal anecdote. So when I was living in Oregon, uh, <laughs> there was a friend of mine, her and her boyfriend, or I guess not really boyfriend, they were broken up at the time, but he was the dad of their child. And my girlfriend at the time, she was babysitting their kid. And so I would see the kid and I would you know, hang out with the, the parents. And actually the boyfriend was a musician too, so we'd play music together and stuff. So super cool, super cool guy. The mom, on the other hand, was a little weird and she was definitely an alcoholic and I always noticed that there was something wrong with their kid their kid was stunted in growth the kid had like the fetal alcohol syndrome type facial features but I didn't want to say anything and then one day we were at the grocery store uh, in the wine aisle because we were just hanging out one night and you know at the time I was super broke so I'd always look for like the cheapest wine and so they had the one that I usually buy for cheap and she's like oh I love that one I used to always drink that when I was pregnant with our kid and I was like, oh, my God. It all just clicked right there. I was like, no wonder why your kid's messed up. Your kid has fetal alcohol syndrome. And then she would always tell me that, like, oh, yeah, the, you know, the, her, his teachers at school are really concerned about him. So we're getting him, like, tested for, like, developmental um, issues and disorders. And, you know, you wanna, we don't know what's going on. I'm like, I know what's going on. <laughs> you're drinking when you're pregnant. So, yeah, avoid at all costs drinking alcohol when you're pregnant, like, the kid is going to have some neurological deficits, among other things. Fetal alcohol syndrome is going to affect their cogn cognitive abilities when they grow when they're developing and growing up. It also has some like physical, uh, just physical characteristics associated with fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome too. So yeah, if anybody's an alcoholic, tell them to stop, like put the booze down. And if they have to go into like some sort of detox using like an Ativan protocol or something like that, that's way preferred. And alcohol is super damaging to the developing baby. That's a good question, though. What's up? Not necessarily. And yeah, the thing is, like, a lot of people don't even know they're pregnant until, like, sometimes a couple months into the pregnancy, right? Eight weeks is two months into the pregnancy. That's, like, a long time. And that's the danger window. It's, like, three to eight weeks is that period of fetal development that they are really at high risk of getting affected by things like alcohol and other substances 
So a lot of people don't know if they're pregnant until like week or month two. So it's like they might still be boozing <laughs> while the kid is developing in the womb. But um, your question was if they had, if mom had a couple drinks or something and didn't realize she was pregnant, would the kid have fetal alcohol syndrome? I don't know. It depends on how heavily mom is drinking. If she's drinking like, I don't know, a fifth of Jack Daniels a day or something like that, <laughs> maybe. That would probably cause fetal alcohol syndrome. But just a couple glasses of wine, I don't think that would cause any issues. Pretty sure my mom drank a little bit of wine when I was pre when she was pregnant with me. That's probably why it turned out the way I did. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, good question. I love all that stuff. That's good stuff. But anyways, back to ADHD. Uh, these things do not cause ADHD. Sugar, TV, poverty, bad parenting. It's it's going to be more organic in nature. What are the symptoms of ADHD? Obviously, the hallmark is going to be difficulty paying attention. Right, daydreaming is going to be one of those things as well. Uh, impulsive behavior, right? They're going to blurt out when they shouldn't be blurting out in class, for example. Uh, they're going to also be taking risks, like risky type behaviors. Um, difficult time resisting temptation, right? You guys are familiar with the marshmallow test? The marshmallow test? So what, is, what, is, what, what do they do with the marshmallow test, dude? Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's more than that. So they'll... They'll do the marshmallow test with children, and they'll tell the kid, hey, if you can wait 15 minutes without eating the marshmallow, you're going to get another marshmallow. So that's, that's the premise of the marshmallow test. So some kids, and there's videos of this online you can watch, and it's funny, right, because some kids cannot control their impulses. So they'll eat the marshmallow without even caring about the future. So they're, they don't have an easy time foregoing immediate gratification for, like, future benefits. And there's actually, and then there's kids that can, right? There's some kids that wait the 15 minutes and they'll get the second marshmallow. So they get like uh, a reward for actually staving off that immediate gratification. There's been studies on those kids long term. The kids that are impulsive at ch during childhood don't really succeed much as adults. Whereas the kids that were able to actually control their impulses at the marshmallow test they tend to do well when they're older. They tend to be able to forego immediate gratification. They're less impulsive, right? And so they actually like work hard to be able to reap the rewards later on in their lives. So um, individuals with ADHD, they would not pass the marshmallow test. They would gobble up the marshmallow, right? They wouldn't have an easy time staving off that immediate gratification for long-term rewards. Fidgeting, squirming, losing things, talking too much, right? Chatty Cathy, <laughs> making careless mistakes, having troubles taking turns, right? Taking turns is in like in class, right? Like waiting your turn um, and ha having difficulties getting along with others. Again, just like the other things that I was showing you, the different self-assessments for like depression, for anxiety, you can do this as well to see if you test positive for ADHD. Um, not the worst thing on earth to test positive for ADHD. I have a lot of friends that have ADHD. You know, they take their Ritalin, they take their Adderall, they take their Vyvanse, and they're able to function pretty well. As a matter of fact, some of the highest functioning individuals that I went to med school with had ADHD, and they were on a lot of Adderall, and they did really well. So you could treat it with different types of drugs, and it can actually help to, you know, uh, uh, avoid any of the symptoms of ADHD, and you can function pretty well uh, with those meds for the most part. Some people abuse those meds because, of course, uh, what is Adderall? It's methamphetamine, right? It's methamphetamine salts or amphetamine salts. So it can be addictive, and it can be abused, and it can be used recreationally too. What's up? That who? Yeah, Adderall is like the drug that keeps you hyper focused, right? Um, Vyvanse is like the more expensive version of Adderall. And when I had to take my board exams for medical school, for past medical school, I borrowed Vyvanse from a friend <laughs> so I could be able to focus during my exam. And it worked really well. Like during the exam, I was just like rocking it. Yeah, nothing distracted me whatsoever. I was just completely focused on my task. And so that's kind of how those drugs work. They help you stay narrowly focused on whatever given task that you're doing. So that's kind of the mechanism behind uh, Adderall, Vyvanse. I don't really know exactly how Ritalin works too well, but Adderall and Vyvanse as amphetamines, they help maintain focus. 